الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم اما بعد حبت في الله continue on in our study of Bulugha Maram we reach the chapter chapter 2 in the marital uh, Kitab and Nikah in the book of marriage and chapter 2 comprises of a hadith related to the relations with the wives Bab Ishratin Nisa so in this chapter, we will look at a hadith which refer to how the mu'amalat, the way in which the relations between the husband and wife, and how they should deal with one another, and how the husband specifically should deal with the wife in some of the permissible ways in which a husband and wife uh, relate to one another and those things which are also prohibited and in general uh, Islam encourages us of course to be righteous with our spouses and this goes for the men and the women and to fulfill one another's rights to the best of our ability and This chapter, or these ahadith, are in relation to how that relationship should be. These hadith show and illustrate how that marital bond should be completed and what is permissible and impermissible with regards to that, those relationships uh, or those relations between the husband and wife. And the way in which the husband and wife relate to one another, this also returns back to the culture, the culture of, or the particular customs of the society also bears an impact uh, Islamically in how they relate to one another. However, their Islam gives you the general borders and boundaries in relation to how uh, one defines what is good. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about how the men should treat their wives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَعَاشُرُوهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ And treat them with goodness you know live with them in goodness so this this is the general principle coming from the Quran which shows how men and women should relate to one another and this is in Surah to Nisa verse uh, 19 also Allah Azza wa Jal says fi kitab al-kareem wallahunna mithlu alladhi alayhinna bil ma'roof and this is in Surah al-Baqarah verse 228 where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and for them is similar to those uh, meaning those maybe from in their custom or the women that are like them uh, in goodness meaning that this and this is the evidence the scholars use for saying that it goes back to this ma'roof goes back to the orf or the custom and even the term ma'roof comes from orf. So the orf, and, and, and you know, it, it also has a relationship with custom or the culture and also with goodness. And so here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that the women should be treated in accordance with those women similar, meaning they should not be treated less than the other women in their family or the other women in their tribe or in their society but in fact they should be treated uh, on equal terms and in righteousness and one of the wisdoms 
for treating with this model and treating with goodness and righteousness is that of course this brings about love and affection in the relationship that when people treat one another with kindness and respect in the marriage whether that be physically mentally or spiritually that all of these things these all of these uh, characteristics they affect your marital bond and they affect how the spouses think of one another and they can help increase the love and the mercy and the kindness and respect for one another or they can do the opposite if a person is not treating the other partner uh, in a righteous way that they can decrease the respect and decrease the kindness and create ill will and even cause divorce or violence or the other uh, repercussions and harmful results of a spoiled marriage and wicked treatment. So it's very important to always emphasize the goodness in a relationship and try to be consistent with that. This is what we learn in general uh, from this group of ahadith that we are about to study that deal with the relations uh, with the wives. And one of the important things that relate to the ma'roof in the marriage that this this goodness and treating one another with goodness and giving one another their rights uh, that by doing so and a part of that is that they enjoy one another meaning that they have physical relations with one another in the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded them and the way in which this ma'roof is explained by some of the ulama is also that the man comes to the wife and has relations with her uh, you know the sexual relations with her that this is a part of fulfilling that ma'roof because of course all of us have shahwa and our shahwa or our desires are filled in the lawful way through the marital bond. This is what Islam uh, encourages and only makes lawful as legitimate. It's the only legitimate way is through the marital bond or in the case of war captives uh, and in and, and this situation. But other than that, that, that is the only permissible way for one for a man to fulfill his shahwa. So that's why it's very important this aspect of marriage as well. And that it is done in the way that is legislated. And one of the ways in which it's prohibited, of course, is why the woman is menstruating. And as we'll see, that this is also the case, uh, as mentioned in the first hadith, or in the first few ahadith about other ways which are impermissible uh, to fulfill this uh, to fulfill one's sexual desires in the marital bond so in the first hadith in this uh, chapter 2 the relations with the wives and it is the 867th hadith in accordance with uh, my uh, text narrated Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala'an Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said he who has intercourse with a woman through her anus is accursed Abu Dawood and Nisa'i reported it and the wording is his and Nisa'i its narrators are reliable but it was considered to be defective for being morsel, a missing link after the tabi. 
what we learn from this hadith, one of the important points that are uh, derived from this hadith and other uh, evidences uh, in the Quran, in the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, is that uh, the scholars, the fuqaha, the scholars are united that uh, sexual intercourse through the anus is prohibited in Islam. And it's very important for us to know that, which I think is widespread as far as the knowledge amongst Muslims, but unfortunately, as with other nations, that we follow the sunnahs of other people and these practices happen. And I believe that most of the people who practice this practice realize that this is impermissible, that this is an impermissible uh, practice. And this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ, although this hadith is considered mursal, you know, having a missing link after the tabi'i, that it, so it is defective even though the narrators are reliable. In the hadith, it mentions mal'oon man ata imra'a fi dubriha. Mal'oon, meaning that the person is cursed. The one, cursed is the one who comes, who uh, approaches his wife through, or who has relations with the wife through her anus. So this hadith is very clear. And the Prophet وسلم, if this hadith narration is sahih, uh, has mentioned that there is a curse attached to this action, meaning anal sex. And that whenever we find in the Quran or in the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, a text which mentions a curse, then this is an indication, as some of the scholars mention, that this action, the action that is mentioned with the curse is one of the major sins. So that's one of the ways that you distinguish the major sins from the minor sins. Is that when there's a curse attached to that action that it lets us know that this action uh, is, is one of the major sins. What we learn from this hadith One of the benefits of this hadith is this hadith shows us that having sexual relations with a woman through the anus, even if it's uh, the person's wife, as the Prophet وسلم, is mentioning, uh, is one of the major sins. And that's because, as we mentioned, uh, it, uh, the hadith mentions that the one, this one is cursed, attaches a curse to this action. Another benefit that we derive from this hadith is this hadith also is a warning to avoid this major sin and that is anal sex. And that's because the Prophet والسلام, warned his ummah that the one who does this is cursed. So this is a warning for the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam to suffice with the other ways that the husband and the wife can enjoy one another. And that the anus, our anal sex, is prohibited. Another benefit derived from this hadith is this hadith also uh, clarifies and gives some of the wisdom 
behind this prohibition, behind this prohibition on this vile act. And that is because it made it from one of the major sins by attaching a curse to this action. Ben Othimin mentions because that doing this action, meaning anal sex, that there is mafsada, that there is a, a lot of wickedness and a lot of harm that results from this action. And that by doing this action that the person actually misses on the permissible beneficial actions and he's going to explain that we're going to explain that very shortly and he says he mentions and that uh, that if a person has relations with his wife sexual intercourse uh, through the uh, through the anus then this is a harmful practice and he says it's a filthy practice and in fact the sheikh gets a bit explicit because as he mentions that the of course the anus is a place of uh, for your waste to come out so that by engaging in this practice that this is going against your nature and likewise it is possibly causing the filth to be uh, passed from one another in this way and infections can result likewise it has become well known uh, that individuals who practice this for long periods of time, this happens a lot of times with uh, men, وَعِيَاذٍ بِاللَّهِ practicing homosexual behavior, and that this activity, uh, from according to many doctors, or some of the doctors mention, that, you know, this place, the anus is normally a place, since it is created for things to leave it, for waste to, to be deposited through it, that by entering it, it causes it to, uh, the anus itself to become loose, and the ailments that result from that, and also incontinence in later in life, that some people, as they were practicing these types of behavior throughout their life, throughout their lifetime, when they become older, that they sometimes have to wear diapers because of incontinence because it, this place is not it's a place for uh, for waste to be deposited from uh, waste leaving from and not a place of entrance and all the filth and the harm that can result from that another part of that hikmah is that by a person doing that they miss the mentha that Ben Othimi was mentioning, the benefit. And the benefit is that if a person does it the halal way, through the, uh, you know, by a man and a woman through the vagina, Allah, that the, uh, that, you know, there's the possibility she becomes pregnant and they have a child, ta'ala, which is one of the maqasid of marriage. It's one of the uh, things that are intended uh, through the marital bond is to have children and hopefully righteous children. Those are just some of the benefits of that hadith. In the next hadith, <clears throat> narrated Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah will not look at a man who has intercourse with a man or a woman through the anus. Reported by At-Tirmidhi, An-Nisa'i, and Ibn Hibban. But it was considered to be defective for being mawquf, a saying of a companion, meaning that of Ibn Abbas, radiyallahu ta'ala anhum. In this hadith, 
it also illustrates uh, the impermissibility of anal uh, anal uh, sex and that this prohibition min baba ola having relations with a man homosexuality is impermissible in Islam and is con considered cursed and one of the major sins and so this hadith uh, affirms for us that although and it's very important for us to understand that because some of the people try to in this contemporary time they try to justify homosexuality in Islam they try to say that uh, homosexuality is permissible and you have this practice you have it in South Africa where it's uh, gay marriage is uh, is allowed in America. Gay marriage is allowed. So you have certain imams that are actually gay imams. They're openly gay, and they uh, are married to men, and they promote this. So there's a couple of points here. For one, by promoting this, by saying this is permissible, then this is disbelief because this is well known. There's ijma. There's no ulama in Islam who say that this is a, a permissible practice. This is only from these people who are modernist and influenced by secularism who have who promote these practices of homosexuality and, and legitimizing this practice. And so this is clearly a violation of Islam and an impermissible act. And this hadith shows us not only that the act, although the Prophet ﷺ mentioned a man or a woman, uh, you know, anal sex is impermissible, but we also uh, can derive from this hadith that homosexuality is impermissible. And there are other evidences to show us this. And even the hujjah of the people of, of the evidence which comes from the Quran, the people of, of Lot or Lut, that they preferred men over women and they were destroyed uh, due to this. So from this hadith, some of the benefits and things we have to look at is a statement here in this hadith where he said la yandrullah that Allah will not look at and then mention uh, Allah will not look at a man who has intercourse with a man or a woman through the anus so this also illustrates that this is a major sin because if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not bless someone by looking at them then this is a sign that this is a major sin this is due to some major sin it's not a minor sin so this also shows us this is something major and this is from the bab of wa'id uh, uh you know of punishment the threat of punishment this does not mean however that allah cannot see the people however this is related to that Allah will not look at them and give them his mercy and his gentleness as the ulama mentioned but this does not mean Allah, that this is hidden from Allah that Allah does, is unaware that this is some shortcoming with Allah but rather it means that he subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, will not grant them mercy and leniency for the wickedness that they used to do. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, In the Allah la yakhfa alayhi shayin fil ardi wa la fil sama. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in Kitab al Kareem in Surah Al Ali Imran, that verily, in the Allah uh, la yakhfa alayhi shay, that nothing is hidden from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the earth, or in the earth, or in the heavens, nothing is hidden from the Creator of the heavens and earth, Subhanahu wa Taala. 
So that lets us know and gives us an indication to make sure that we have a correct understanding of this hadith. Some of the important fawa'it of this hadith first is that this hadith affirms the nadr lillah subhanahu wa ta'ala azza wa jal that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what we understand from this is the opposite of the mafhum mafhum al-mukhalifa is that Allah will look to those people who are righteous the righteous people those people who do uh, goodness and the evildoers the wicked ones like the people who do this and the fujjah, uh, they will not have the na'mah and the blessings of looking and seeing their Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala in Yom Al-Qiyamah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Kitab Al-Kareem in, in Surah Al-Mutafifin, verse 15, كَلَّا إِنَّهُمْ عَنْ رَبِّهِمْ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ لَمَحْجُوبُونَ That, nay, or rather, they will not, uh, or they will on that day, meaning the day of Yom Qiyamah, be, there will be a barrier between them and their Lord. They will not see Allah So this is very important to let us know that this is a characteristic of the Valimin, those people who are wicked sinners and oppressors, those people who oppress themselves by doing wicked sins and immersing themselves in sins, and it affirms that the people of Ta'a, of obedience to Allah, they will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Yom Al-Qiyamah. But the people of Ma'asiyah, especially the major sins and disbelief, that unless Allah subhanahu, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not uh, from the fujjah will not allow them to see him subhanahu wa ta'ala so this is a part of their punishment and it lets us know that this uh, this action is a major sin another benefit of this hadith is that this hadith shows us that a man having relations with another man, homosexuality, is from one of the major sins. And the way in which we understand that is because from this hadith is a shadeed wa'id, meaning there's a, a very strong punishment attached that the, that the people will not be able to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not look at them, meaning not give them their His mercy and his favor on that day. So this lets us know it's from one of the major sins. And the Prophet ﷺ, he also distanced himself from people uh, who did the major sins, and this, especially this sin of homosexuality. So this shows us that this goes against the nature of human being, and that this is a wicked sin and in another hadith which is that many of the ulama have uh, declared as sound which illustrates this point and strengthens the understanding of this hadith that homosexuality is impermissible is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in a hadith uh, in uh, Ruahu Ahmed in Muslim Imam Ahmed wa Abu Dawood that men wajed to muhu yamalu amala kumil loot faktulu fa'ilu fa'ila wumifula di. So the Prophet Ali Salatu Salam said, and this is in accordance with many of the Imams of, of Hadith have said that this is a sound narration that the Prophet ﷺ said that wherever you find them, the one who does uh, the actions of the people of Lut, that they should be 
uh, killed the one who does it and the one who has it done to him. So this hadith affirms for us the impermissibility of homosexuality and that, that this was the action of, of the people of, of Lut because this same punishment is not the case for the husband and wife or, or the man uh, the, husband, the husband and wife if the husband goes to his wife through the anus that this punishment this is not meant this is not the maqsood of this hadith but rather this hadith illustrates for us that this is one of the major sins and that this is reserved for men practicing this action on other men وَعِيَاذٍ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ ذَلِكَ And finally, a last uh, benefit of this hadith is that this hadith also shows that if a, uh, that whoever uh, has relations with his wife uh, through the anus that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not look at them Yom al -Qiyama. so they will be without the that mercy from their Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala whom they we all need his mercy so it's a it's a stern warning to avoid this major sin and that the one who does this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not look to them uh, unless they make toba, unless they repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sincerely meaning that they stop the action, they're determined not to return to it, and uh, they have that sincere intention to not return to it. That unless they, and, and they feel sorrow for this action, those are some of the, those are the, the conditions for repentance. So that one must repent if they want to gain the grace, mercy, and favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this life as well as the hereafter. In the next hadith, the 869th hadith, <coughs> narrated Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, he who believes in Allah in the last day should not harm his neighbor. And take my advice regarding good treatment of women, for they were created from a rib and indeed the most crooked part of the rib is its upper part. If you attempt to straighten it, you will break it. And if you leave it alone, it will remain crooked. So take my advice regarding good treatment of women. Agreed upon. And the wording is that of Al-Bukhari. Imam Muslim has so if you enjoy her, you will do so while crookedness remains in her. But if you attempt to straighten her, you will break her. And breaking her is divorcing her. In this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, this hadith is also, and that's why it's in the chapter of the relations with wives, is also a further illustration and evidence for the kindness between spouses and that the Prophet والسلام, gave us the best example of how to treat our wives and that that relationship was built upon kindness and understanding and mercy and tolerance and so in this hadith, the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala an, the Prophet sallallahu said, He who believes in Allah in the last day should not harm his neighbor. This illustrates the importance of Iman, Iman billah, and the last day. And that the one 
who is has true iman and strong iman and complete iman, iman uh, is someone who will be kind with their neighbor and respectful of their neighbors and not causing harm nor oppressing their neighbor. So that is from the important teachings of Islam. And the Prophet ﷺ said, He who believes in Allah in the last day. Those are from the pillars of Iman. And the Prophet ﷺ said in an authentic hadith, when asked about Iman, he said, and tu'mina billahi wa malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa rasulihi wa liyawm al-akhir wa tu'mina bi qadri khayrihi wa shar The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Al-Iman it is to believe uh, in Allah and his angels and his books and the day of judgment uh, and the prophets and the day of judgment and to believe in the divine destiny the good and the evil in it meaning the, the Qadr so in that hadith the Prophet ﷺ mentioned those pillars of Iman the six pillars of Iman and the two that are mentioned here the Prophet ﷺ when he said he who believes in Allah and the last day and what should they do? They should be kind to their neighbors. So the Prophet ﷺ uh, made a relationship between being kind to one's neighbors, which is a part of complete Iman, and the usul of Iman, which is believing in Allah and believing in the Day of Judgment. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, and take my advice regarding good treatment of women for they were created from a rib and indeed the most crooked part of the rib is its upper part if you attempt to straighten it you will break it so the Prophet ﷺ then advised his ummah to be uh, for the male members of his ummah specifically and in general the spouses uh, so the Prophet ﷺ said that to be kind with the wives. Be kind or be good treatment of the women. So here the Prophet ﷺ said that it was, it, it was general. So the, of course this includes wives. And in this context it is in reference to wives. But in general to all the women uh, in the Ummah. And all those women that you are responsible for whether it be your mother, your sisters, your grandmother, your aunts, uh, all of the women kinfolk, and in general that the Ummah is responsible for caring for its women. And more specifically, this hadith makes reference to uh, for the wives, because the Prophet ﷺ said, And take my advice regarding good treatment of women, for they were created from a rib, and indeed the most crooked part of the rib is its upper part. If you attempt to straighten it, you will break it. And if you leave it alone, it will remain crooked. So take my advice regarding good treatment of the women. And in the other narration, it shows that, and the breaking of that rib is divorce. So the Prophet ﷺ made a similitude and said the women are like a uh, a crooked part, uh, a part of, uh, they're like the rib, which is crooked. And that you should be gentle with this, uh, uh, with, with the women because they are fragile, like your ribs are fragile. And the ribs are uh, curved. And the women, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, that they have this uh, curvature as well. Not meaning the physical curvature of the uh, body, but meaning that they are, uh, that they perhaps, you know, have some ways in which they will have a deficiency 
meaning that sometimes the women are not allowed to pray due to their menstruation. And this is a type of uh, a type of shortcoming with regards to their religion, that they are missing out on their, their salat and their fasting during this time. And likewise, that the women have a tendency to be more emotional. This is ge the general fitra uh, and, and the, the nature of the women is that they tend to be more fragile and more emotional. Whereas men, in general, tend to be more rational. However, we see that with time and the changing of roles and perhaps the food, the diets, and all these kind of environmental factors, that the, our natures are beginning to change. Wallahu musta'an. But in general, uh, we, we understand from this hadith and others that the women, uh, and from <coughs> uh, general experience, that the women uh, tend to be more uh, emotional, whereas men tend to be more, uh, more rational. And with that emotion, comes affection and comes other things which we often find more uh, that women tend to have those attributes versus men. So the Prophet وسلم, advised to be kind to the women and in the hadith in uh, Sahih Muslim he said but if you attempt to uh, to straighten her you will break her and breaking her is divorcing her. So this lets us know that we're referring to the marital bond, specifically women uh, in the marital bond, meaning your wives, and that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that we should enjoy their in their crookedness, meaning accept them for who they are, and be patient and enjoy them. That all of us have shortcomings, and all of us have ways. Sometimes you find something in someone that you may not find pleasing as an attribute, but through patience and time, you might, and you, you, you find other attributes of them which oversee and supersede that shortcoming, that they're very uh, excellent in one way, and the shortcoming is, is in something else. So the Prophet Wasallam is advising the men from his ummah to be patient and enjoy them in their crookedness, enjoy them in their shortcomings. You know, still enjoy one another, be tolerant of one another and respectful of one another because when you attempt to change the women too much from her nature, that this attempt to sh uh, straighten her in your eyes will can result in the breaking of her. And the breaking of her is that she's unable to, to deal with the stress and the difficulty you've placed upon her and the burden and the fighting and it will lead to divorce. So it's very important to understand this hadith in this context. Some of the many benefits of this hadith, one of the first benefits is this hadith shows us uh, this hadith is a warning, a stern warning to not be harmful to our neighbors. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, Men kana yu'minu billahi wal yawm al-akhir fala yu'di jarahu. The Prophet ﷺ said, And whoever believes in Allah and the last day, then do not harm Right, then he should not harm his neighbor. So uh, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, as we mentioned, coupled those aspects of Iman with this aspect, letting us know that being kind to one's neighbor is a part of Iman. That's a part of faith. And this is a stern warning to avoid harming and insulting one's neighbor. And may Allah forgive us of our many shortcomings. Amin ya Rabbil Alameen. The second benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us that harming the neighbor is from one of the major sins as well. And this is because 
uh, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that this was a part of Iman. So by neglecting this, the one who does this and does this act of disobedience, this ma'asi, then they are threatened with a punishment, wa'id, and aquba, meaning punishment, without doubt. And so this lets us know, uh, and, and especially in relation to other ahadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, wallahi la yu'min Wallahi la yu'min Wallahi la yu'min Man la ya'min jaruhu Bawa'ika Biwa'ikahu Ya'ni Zulmuhu wa ghashmuhu The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said in another authentic hadith which is in Sahih Bukhari and in Muslim uh, He said he swore three times. He said, Wallahi, by Allah, they don't believe. By Allah, they don't believe. Or by Allah, he doesn't believe. Whoever, whoever's neighbor does not feel safe around him from his harm and oppression. So that lets us know the Prophet ﷺ made such a strong emphasis on it. And if he makes a strong emphasis on something like this, then it lets us know it's a part of Iman and that it is Ma'asi to go against that, letting us know it is one of the major sins because it's so serious. The Prophet ﷺ wouldn't have mentioned it three times if that were not the case. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith affirms for us the day of judgment. Ithbat yom al akhirah That the day of judgment, that this is one of the pillars of Iman. And this affirms for us that it will take place. Uh, and that we should be fearful of that day for our many, many sins and shortcomings. Wallahu musta'an. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows the, illustrates the, um, the completeness and perfection of uh, the religion of Islam. And that the Prophet ﷺ uh, advised those who are generally stronger with regards, especially physically, and hopefully mentally, that that are often taking the role of leadership in the society and in the marriage, he advised them to take care of those who are weaker, which is the wives. The wives are in a, a weaker position than the men, and this is why the men, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Arijala kawimun al nisa," that men are the maintainers and protectors of the women. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also uh, clarifies that uh, the, the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on his ummah and that and this is in the showing that Islam differs from the ways of Jahiliyyah and that Islam especially when it came to the Arabs there during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam really gave them humanity and gave them civility because they were very backward people who had very backwards customs that they took pride in causing harm to the women. Women didn't inherit. Women were harmed. Women were, uh, girls were buried alive because they were displeased with girls. What kind of society can you even have when you kill the women, uh, the the female children? And this, even these, subhanAllah, these customs of the days of Jahiliyyah amongst the Arabs are still are practiced in some societies. In India, for example, in uh, China to a degree, that they're displeased when they have girls. And some, they, this results in infanticide, infanticide where they kill the children, kill the female girls from a lack of mercy. And can you imagine being a human being and burying a girl child alive, a, a female a, a, a child alive? Even burying an animal alive shows a lack of mercy. So these were not a merciful people. Their jahiliyyah was strong and full of evil. And the way in which they harm the, the, the people, harm the women, the oppression, 
is unimaginable. And so Islam, this hadith here, illustrates the opposite of that characteristic because the Prophet ﷺ ordered the men to care for the women. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us the excellent uh, way in which the Prophet ﷺ educated his ummah. He educated his nation with uh, ex by giving them examples and explaining sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Another uh, benefit of this hadith is this hadith also illustrates that women were created from the rib. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, فَإِنَّهُنَّ خُلِكْنَا مِن ضَلَعِي مِن ضَلَعِي the Prophet ﷺ said, Verily, they were created from the rib. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us uh, a very important lesson, and that is that it is an obligation on men to be patient uh, with women to be patient with their shortcomings even. So this is an important reminder for us to be kind to our women folk in general and more specifically to our wives. And this is because uh, from this hadith and many other evidences from the Quran and the Sunnah which show us the importance of being kind to one another and kind to the women and kind and gentle to our spouses and that the Prophet ﷺ was the best to his wives. And that lets us know that we should be concerned with making du'a for our, our spouses and not arguing and fighting nor cursing nor acting arrogant or, or ignorant with them. And so that is uh, the example of the Prophet wasallam is the opposite of those wicked characteristics in that we should try to Follow the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and follow the good. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us the severity of divorce upon the women. That many women, they take the divorce, uh, it's very difficult for them. And that's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَقَسْرَهَا طَلَاقُهَا That breaking her is uh, divorcing her. And even from experience of what we see in the societies, especially in Muslim societies, and more specifically you find this especially in the Arab societies, because a lot of times it becomes difficult, although this is changing, but in some of the societies, especially in the Khalij, uh, but even the poorer nations, even in Yemen, to marry a divorcee, you know, divorcees it's very hard for them to remarry a lot of times. So if a woman has been divorced and a man has divorced her from oppression or because he, he had more than one wife, we have a lot of circumstances like this where men, they marry more than one wife and they can't handle the heat and the difficulty that they, and they're not patient with their first wife and what she's saying and, 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 and her inability to cope. So he divorces the new wife, which was a virgin. So then you have these young girls perhaps sometimes with, chi with a child who are divorced and may find great difficulty, if not impossibility, uh, to, to find another husband. So of course this shatters her whole life, her whole life aspirations. So it shows us the seriousness of talaq and that we should not take it as a light matter and that women generally do not tend to take it as something light. It can be a very, a breaking of their heart and breaking of their persons even hurting their soul even some women don't cope and can cause them mental illness or even to suicide a last benefit of this hadith because we are studying these uh, hadith is that this is also something that the talib al-ilm must illustrate uh, and must be uh, uh, an excellent example when it comes to dealing with their wives and their, their women folk. Uh, because they are illustrating 
they should be illustrating the son of the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the fact that you are studying and seeking knowledge, this is an elevation of your status. And with this comes responsibility of setting an example for others. And these are just some of the many benefits of this hadith.